All right. Hello, Metal Maniacs. It's the Meister from Brews and Tunes. Cheers. Uh, very excited today. I'm chatting with the one and only uh, Metal Thrashing Mike, of course, of the band uh, Infernal Tyrant and of the podcast. Uh, great podcast that you all need to check out for sure. Uh, Metal Thrashing Nerd. Um, so, Mike, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good, man. Uh, just uh, we're we're out and about today, you know. So you get an interview in the car. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That works. That yeah. Cheers to that. That's great. Um, hey, so first off, I just need to I need to congratulate you on the release of your summer EP that came out uh, in early July. Kicks ass! What a great, amazing EP. And actually, the whole the whole project. I'm, I've been really digging it. Um, and I love the fact that you know. I mean, of course. Your first album, full length album, Fall from Grace, came out uh, in last year in 2022, and then yeah. this year, uh, rather than doing a full album, you've been doing this really cool thing of the seasonal EPs, which I love. Yeah. I think that's brilliant. Um, yeah, what what kind of what prompted that? What was the kind of the impetus behind doing that? You know, when you're in a, a recording project and you don't tour, you kind of have to have something where you can promote things. So for us, it was like, well, we'll just do seasonal EPs, three songs in EP and promote it that way. And then nice. I'm, I'm thinking next year it'll be a lot of just random singles and things like that. And we're talking about doing like a physical. Oh, okay. Yeah, finally doing a physical thing. Uh, oh, being really you know, CD. Oh, cool. Because vinyls, uh, it's damn near impossible to get and it's just super expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard it's pretty pricey to to run vinyl. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, thousands of dollars to run, you know, vinyl, and then you have to sell all of it to break even. And it's hard. It's really hard to break even on vinyl when you look at the prices, how much it costs, and just how much you can charge for it being an underground band. So, yeah, yeah, I would imagine that could be, yeah, definitely could get pricey. And, um, yeah, you're going to have to have like a label or somebody behind that with you. Um, I know, uh, like black doom but they're out of atlanta um oh yeah they're yeah a lot of people there are friends of mine like i know tommy stewart really well he's a great guy great guy he's been on the podcast uh all, pretty much all his bands have been on my podcast but um you know i just got one from them from uh grave huffer oh yeah cool yeah depart from so much evil is finally out on vinyl and i was like thrilled to get that and i was just so glad that they're with tommy and tommy's so good about getting like vinyl and stuff like that yeah yeah, I, I always say, you know, if I was in a doom band and I was traveling, I'd be, you know, messaging him constantly like, hey, we want on the level, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that would that would be cool. Yeah, because, yeah, he does a great job of promoting and uh, and really supporting the bands that are on his label from what I've seen. It's and he's such a nice guy. Like, as you said, he's a just a gem. Of his, thing. his bands and stuff, too, are just so great Um, as as far as just like just advice to anyone who's trying to promote their music online. If you follow him and Direwolf and uh, Gravehopper, Grave Next Door, all those guys, that's some of the best education you can have in promoting yourself online because they're so good at it. Yeah. Like, it's not just the touring. They are so good at promoting themselves online and sharing things and interacting with people. Uh, it's, it's, it's really inspiring, and I've learned a lot from them, but I'm not quite there where they're at yet, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, it takes a lot of work. It's a lot of work, um, a lot of dedication, and but yeah, it, you know, as you said, you know, Tommy's so good at it. He's just so good at promoting, and 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 you're not spending a ton of money doing it too. Um, yeah, I mean, years of experience too. There. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, he's great. told me stories about you know, I'm I live here in Georgia, you know, where Hallow's Eve came from, and he told me about like all the shows they used to do in Atlanta. Like the first time Slayer came to Georgia to play a show, he booked the show in Atlanta and stuff. Oh and, wow. So, you know, you get a learning tree. You want to sit under them and learn everything you can. Like, I've had so many guests on the podcast, too, where it's like, uh, like Carl Kennedy, I, I told him, I was like, anytime I get the chance to sit under a learning tree, I'm going to, I'm going to try and take any information I can from somebody like you. Yeah, that's cool. I, I That's a great term, the learning tree. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And Carl's. <laughs> <welcome>. <laughs> yeah, that's a great term. I, I love that. Yeah. And as you mean, yeah, Carl, yeah, what a wealth of knowledge there. Great musician. Oh, yeah. No, he was fun. such a great band and um yeah yeah really cool guy he's a really cool guy um well cool that's that's great so um kind of circle back to the to the eps so i would imagine yeah, that, we have the fall ep has got to be coming pretty soon i'm hoping uh, i'm uh, definitely around october i'm okay. not gonna lie though i'm not gonna lie to anybody about this i've hit kind of like a 
like a stumbling stone with the, the fall one. Cause it's like, shit, I just put out the summer one and I, I didn't think I was going to top the spring one. And now I'm worried about topping the summer one. <laughs> and I'm like, well, maybe I just need to like lay back a little bit on it and do some slower, more melodic evil sounding stuff for the fall one. Cause everything else has been more melodic in the sense of like a power metal type of thing. And I, I'm mm -hmm. thinking more like Slayer type of melodic where it's that really dark evil sounding stuff like a dead skin mask or something like that oh, uh out the heaven yeah that kind of I, I think that's where i need to lean with the fall one but i've just been so picky about everything Makes you know sense. You, sense. yeah you hit like a creative stumbling block and i i knew this was going to happen come fall and i'll probably put it together like last minute and get everything done and have it out in october well, I'm I'm very excited to hear it. I can't wait to hear it because yeah, as, as I mentioned, you know, I thought that I like all of them I've loved, but I thought the summer one just, I mean, especially um, on Valkyrie's wings, that that song just grabbed me immediately. I really love that. I love the the long intro. You know, it, I I love the transition. I think it's just a killer song. Just it's you know it's a it kind of a classic almost. It's just got this classic sound to it. Right. My my wife has said that's the best one that I've done so far. The summer EP? Yeah, between me and Billy, as far as what we've done together, she's just like, that's the best one y'all have done so far. Nice, nice. Just like the chorus is really good. Billy's vocals are spot on in it. The way we've, and we've had a lot of reviews and stuff where it's like we'd have, you know, some negative connotations about Billy's vocals, like this and that. Like, it sounds like he's struggling here or something like that. So we've learned to adapt to that a little more. And I think like in particular on Valkyrie's wings, like you, you hear that chorus and Billy's finally found this way to mix his growl and his clean singing together. It's where we get something that's really, I, I think, I think for us, I think it's unique for us. Um, yeah. I don't hear a lot of that where you mix the clean and the growl like that together. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we've definitely got something really cool there that not a lot of bands do. Um, probably partially inspired by like Blind Guardian or something. No, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, nice. yeah well, we're huge Blind Guardian fans. Oh yeah, I love Blind Guardian. You can't tell with all the harmonies and the you know four four. We love those early albums. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that oh uh, yeah, that speed metal era of theirs, like yeah. almost thrash metal. Like yeah, they were doing and still do great stuff. But yeah, that early era of Blind Guardian, you can't beat that. Oh God, yeah, like Follow the Blind, Tales from the Twilight, all somewhere far beyond. I mean, those are just master classes in power metal. Yeah. Yeah, you know um, that and like the early Halloween stuff, you know, before uh, or before uh, Kai left. Yeah. yeah, and then he does Gamma Ray, and it's just like Gamma Ray blows. I, I think Gamma Ray blows Halloween out of the water. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I I I, I love Gamma Ray. I think they're yeah. I, I think um, yeah. He his his, uh, his pacing I thought was a little more interesting. Uh, in yeah, ways and um just kind of conceptually it was because i and i love halloween but our halloween but it it seemed like they kind of got stuck in a rut for a long time uh, yeah and just kind of kept putting out the same album over and over again uh whereas yeah, yeah. i think you're right i think gamma ray just kind of he just you know took off um yeah. yeah he took off and he there's so much of his stuff there man it's like you're you're almost listening to like some new wave of british heavy metal or something sometimes like you're listening to some tiger pan bangs or diamond dead or something yeah that's a good point i love that that's great. yeah you get that new wave of british heavy metal stuff boy my cousin's pulling in you can hear the dogs getting pissed off <laughs> yeah that's okay that's all right oh um, that that'll be a good uh <laughs> background noise for an episode <laughs> yeah there you go there you go um, I, I was so so for those that don't know with with uh infer and with your with your metal project Infernal Tyrant, um, so it's it's essentially you like you play everything, um, you play all the instruments, and then you know Billy, you've got Billy on vocals, but he he wasn't on the first album, was he? Did he sing? On no, the, that's all me, right? Yeah, I thought yeah, that was all you. Yeah, you can hear Billy behind Billy, like you can hear Mike uh, growls and stuff sometimes still. And I just switched over to backing vocals. It, it, I felt like it made it easier on me because mm. there's so much pressure to write this stuff already that you you get to a point where um, you're just like, God, I, I, I'm tired of writing lyrics. I've never been a lyric guy. Oh, okay. Never have been. Like, um, even when I listen to music, a lot of times it's, it's, it's a focus on the music. You know, I, I, I'll listen to the drums or I'll listen to the bass or I'll try to see what the guitars are doing or if there's some keyboards. But never really big on like the the, the lyrical part oh, okay 
like as long as the music underneath it kind of drives the whole thing I, i'm good yeah yeah nice but like, i can't probably can't i, I can probably tell you the lyrics to like peruvian skies by dream theater just because i've listened to the music part so much and been so in <laughs> in you know enthralled with it but otherwise i wouldn't know the lyrics most of the time interesting yeah I, I, that's it's funny. When I was a teenager, though, it was a little bit different, you know, when you're a teenager, you know, because it's that the, the lyrics are very imaginative thing. But I think as as we get older, I think uh, we kind of have an appreciation for what's underneath those lyrics, too. Yeah. You know, for the music. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. It's funny. I it's I, I think I, I I'm in the same. I'm not a musician, but I I'm kind of the same in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah, there's definitely like even my favorite songs. Of all, like I can't sing along. Like I can sing along. But like if somebody said, you know, sing you know this song i'm i i couldn't remember all the lyrics like because i'm i'm just so enthralled by the music and there's and even just the vocals not necessarily what the what the lyrics are but the vocal the you know the the prowess of that that vocalist and, just, and the technique and stuff yeah, really yeah 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 no um that's how i know how you know like with like old sabbath stuff you know like sabotage or volume four like i, I just think ozzy's vocals on those are so fucking good and so what so underappreciated yeah and I, I you know I, I understand the importance of what he does compared to what people say oh well he doesn't write the lyrics no but he provides a great melody for these songs yeah you know he knows how to fit these things in so um yeah like that that's how I learned the lyrics a lot of times is just the melody and you know if you've got a good melody going and you can fit the you know the syllables and stuff in there it's it's a little easier to keep up with right right yeah especially if you're saying like a four four or something you know yeah keeping one of those basic time signatures uh because we play a lot faster but there's a lot of stuff that's in four four and it's like well, the human heartbeat is based or is uh like a, a four four one twenty whereas like the music we're playing where you know the idea for me is to excite so it's 160 170 180 210 you know so yeah. you don't want to go higher and excite somebody you nice. want to increase that like you know the first time you hear rain and blood right yeah, where it just you go back the first time you heard that, it, it, it's an adrenaline rush. Even for somebody that's not in the metal, you hear that riff and you're just like, "What in God's name?" <laughs> yeah. It sounds like Armageddon. Yeah, it, it sounds like blood's gonna rain from the skies. There's something evil about it. I, I remember showing it one time. Uh, there was a like a short period of my life where I was in seminary learning to preach. Hmm. I was a teenager. Yeah, this was a weird time. Um. But I I showed it to one of the uh, the guys that was uh, there at the church, and he was like, because we were talking about music and stuff, and I was learning some of that stuff. But I was showing him that riff, and I was like, "Well, what do you think about that?" And he goes, "Oh, well, that's just that's just demonic by nature." <laughs> you know? And it, it does; it excites a part of the, the human brain. It, it there's a certain you know animalistic side to it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I love that. I, I would love to uh, see the reaction of of that gentleman now with your music. I, I don't know if you're, <laughs> if you're in contact, but yeah, I think, hey, check this out. This is what I'm doing. You might not even be alive anymore for all I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, yeah, so so you play all the instruments. Um, was that That's by perfect. design? Did you decide like, yeah, I'm going to, I don't want to do a band. I want to do my own thing. Because I, I know you and Billy were in a band together prior um, yeah, we were in Malviant. That stuff's still out there if people want to listen to that. We're you know more than happy to let people hear it. Um, our my old drummer from Malviant was on the the first three singles, the ones I did that sound like absolute horseshit. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just I'm gonna start labeling them as the demos. Yeah. So uh Tom played drums on that originally. Um after that it was it, 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 you know it, it it became something I wanted to do by myself just because it was I think it was quarantine time and I was writing stuff and trying to quit smoking and all that. And I had to have something to do. Right. So I just started writing and, um, I started like putting, you know, drum tracks to it, you know, digitally to start with. And then I said, Tom, you think you can do something similar like this? And, you know, he did that on the first three demos. And afterwards I was like, it's a pain in the ass to go to his house, take all my recording equipment, take all the microphones, so I started programming the drums, hmm. but it, it just, it sort of started out as a necessity thing. Cause you know, we stopped, I stopped doing Malviant because my son was born Okay, and I switched jobs, you know, Billy had switched jobs. Uh, there wasn't enough time to do Malviant anymore. 
and it, it kind of came out of necessity like i needed to write and create because i'd spent like the past like two or three years sitting there playing magic the gathering and goofing off and shit you know and i spent that first year not even touching my guitar hardly because it was just so depressing yeah you know because it, it, t- it took us a long time to get malviant together and to get the music together and it was just like it was such a letdown with the like, we had issues with the record label and everything and it was kind of heartbreaking. So I, I really didn't touch guitar hardly for like a year. Wow. But, you know, when he, when I came back, it was a necessity. Cool. Writing music has become a necessity. It, it helps me cope with things. It helps my depression. Um, and it, it's been harder to write music lately. Ironically, I say it's, you know, for coping with depression and things like that. But, you know, uh, not the month, uh, I don't know, I'll say August, July. July, my nephew passed away. He was 13 oh, years old. Wow. And then just um, two weeks ago, yeah, two weeks ago, Friday, my grandfather passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. So, man, yeah, he had a he had a hard time after my nephew died. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, God, where was I going? It's kind of a, it's been hard to write since then. Yeah, like it's been a bit of a, a, a I've just been down. I you know, I mean, this yeah. is. It's how things are, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, you probably need a little time to to kind have of... to adjust to all of this, and there's been a lot of change. And so, with my job, it's like I go in at three o'clock in the afternoon. So usually, I spend the morning with my kid. Hmm. He's four now, and he just started pre-K, so I don't even see him in the mornings. I, and there's this weird thing. It's like he's an inspiration when I'm writing music. Him running around acting crazy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's like it's um. I it's, love that. I feed off of it, you know, and that's probably why the music is so frantic and thing, and you know, in that nature, because he's around. Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought buying a new Les Paul would be like, because I went and bought a new Les Paul. I was like, oh, I'm kind of in a rut here. Let's go buy a new guitar, see if that helps. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, I think it, yeah, you probably just need a little time to kind of absorb everything and, and kind of reassess. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, once you do, I'm sure it'll be very cathartic for you to, to, to start writing again once you get back into it and um, yeah no least metal thing here i spent a week listening to the cure last week <laughs> <laughs> but damned if burn it in such a good track have you ever watched the crow yes yeah great movie yeah the, the soundtrack to that is just amazing and uh oh, burn yeah. by the cure off of that is just for it not be a metal track it's really heavy so yeah. to speak yeah killer song yeah really good song and uh, rollins bands on that and they do like a, a cover of a suicide song about ghost rider <laughs> so oh that's right god i haven't heard that album for years and years i should yeah. no it's it's fun stuff yeah I, I think that's another thing people have to consider too if you're writing music it's all it's always important to explore uh, i know i saw an alan moore quote yesterday do you know who alan moore is yeah yeah great writer Great writer, absolutely. He was talking about the uh, the best way to feed your ima- the the feed your creativity is to overgrow your intelligence and your imagination. Mm. Oh, that's great. So it's, it's always important, especially as a musician or any kind of anything like that, to always be adding. And by the way, what are you drinking today? Oh, sorry, I'm drinking a uh, here. I'll show you. This is a it's from a local brewery called Fisher Brewing Company. It's called the Crest Express. Oh, okay. Bicycle assign. It's a pale ale. Just it's a pale ale. ale. Traditional American pale ale. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Kind of bitter. I've on, <laughs> yeah. I've been on these uh, uh, Claw Hammer, Claw Hammer Oktoberfest kick. Oh, okay. I, I got some Claw Hammer Oktoberfest the other day. It was really good. Uh, we've been, I've been drinking dragon's milk too. Have you ever had a dragon's oh, milk? Oh, delicious. Mm. Yeah. Dangerously uh, I don't delicious. Know if, I don't know if they're all brewed in um, bourbon barrels, but the kind we're getting from that's made in Tennessee is brewed in bourbon barrels. Oh, it's yeah. got like that smoky, you know, I assume it's all brewed in that. Because when I think dragon, I think smoky. Yeah. But it's like smoky, like bourbon kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Delicious. That beer is great. I haven't had that for a little while, but that's, that's a great beer. Yeah. That's that, that one. That one's dangerous too. Cause it's, it goes down pretty easily, but it's, it, it's it goes down easily and it's like potent. It's an 8.5. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, <laughs> gotta watch yourself with that one. Cause it, yeah. I yeah yeah we won't go into that but <laughs> yeah no, they're, they're good. yeah that and, uh if I buy like non you know craft beers it's like Yingling or yeah, Heineken yeah import Heineken if it's local it's Yingling nice yeah yeah that that's that's a broke week <laughs> <laughs> that's all right that's all right yeah I 
I uh, there's a bar my wife and I go to that's really close by, and uh, and they have a lot of craft beer there. But for some reason, when I'm in that bar, I want a Pabst. Like that's just that bar. I always want to drink a Pabst there. I like Pabst on tap. Yeah, that and Dos Equis. Like if you get Dos Equis on tap, it's like the best. Oh, it's delicious. Yeah, I love it on tap. I love Dos Equis on tap. Um, I, I like last year on my birthday, I drank. I just ordered a pitcher and drank a whole pitcher there while I was eating Mexican food. It was great. <laughs> nice. good, for, good for you. Cheers. Cheers to that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, well, liquid death right now. Oh, um, you have you ever had, oh God, see, because you're bruising tunes, right? So we can yeah. talk about beer. Yeah. Have yeah. you ever had um, Tremens Delirium? Yes. That is probably top two or three beers for me that I've ever had. Yeah, great beer. Yeah, I haven't had one for a while. I need it. It's been a while. That's all my buddy Matt drinks. Like, he plays in the punk band and all this, and all he ever drinks is, like, trimmings and stuff. <laughs> nice. Like, it's hard to get him to drink anything else. Like, he, he came over to the house the other week after my grandfather had died, and he just came up with a cooler, and he opened it up, and it's just full of trimmings. And I was like, oh, God, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason you're my best friend. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Oh, that's that's a good friend. That's a good friend. Yeah. Right? That's a good friend. No, but back to the the, the 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 music. I mean, absolutely. If you got questions, go ahead. Sorry, I I got I, I go off the rails. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Yeah, this is good. I love this. Um, well, I did want to. I was curious about that. So the first album, uh, the Fall from Grace, uh, and and I, I again, I I love all your music, and I love the 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 how you change and kind of evolve with with everything. You know, they they don't all sound the same. I think that's great. Um that's and and you can tell there's a lot of influence you 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 know you can tell you listen to a lot of different stuff i mean it comes out in, in the way you write and then in the way you play because i i think with the first album what one thing i really loved i loved how raw it was and it not necessarily it doesn't necessarily sound like it but it reminds me it has that tom warrior kind of rawness to it that's what i really love about it um maybe it's partly the vocals cross tail hammer yeah yeah there's yeah just kind of that vibe to it, even like a little taste of like even a little touch of like Bathory or something. It just has this oh, yeah, rawness to it. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that stuff. I'm a huge Bathory fan, but yeah, there's, there's an element of Bathory and, you know, going back to like you asked before, like what was some of the reason you do it like this? I I, I can't believe I totally forgot, but Quarthon's like part of the inspiration. Cause it was like, he always did that stuff from home. He didn't tour. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, one man band. Yeah, I'm a huge, a huge fucking Bathory band uh, fan, and we're actually talking about doing a Bathory cover. We're talking about doing um for all those who died. Oh, right on. Yeah, no, it's like such a super simple song, but it's so heavy. Yeah, and uh, you know, I wish I could find that riff where I could do something like that, where it's just super simple and heavy. But <laughs> I always overcomplicate and tentacle, do tentacle shit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the that's the shred influence, I guess. All the Joe Satriani and stuff like that over the years. Um, Megadeth for sure. Nice. No, but uh, as far as the influences go, yeah. Um, the vocals. I know when I when I sent it to Billy and he first heard it, he was like, "You you, you kind of got like a, uh, a David Vincent Morbid Angel thing going on." And I was like, Ooh. "Yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. see that." I I think the biggest compliment I've got, somebody said it reminded them of Creator, and I was like, oh, that makes me so happy. I love Creator. I've seen them live three times, man. Oh, yeah, great band. Great band live. Yeah, amazing band live. I got on this German kick like eight or nine years ago, and I have not gotten off of it. <laughs> you know? Good for you, yeah. They, so I've yeah. got like, all the early Creator on vinyl. I've got like everything Blind Guardian's got. Uh, there's uh, just a lot of that influence in all the music. You know, you can probably hear some creator stuff. Um, probably some like, there's some like middle era Slayer influence just off of some of the chords and chord choices for certain things. Hmm. Like uh, Divine Intervention has some of those weird like chords in it and they do odd stuff with those riffs. Yeah. The open riff, yeah. Um, same with like People of the Lie. Hmm. Great stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of like random influences. Um just over the past year it's been a lot of yes oh cool like i've been listening to closer to the edge and stuff like that love that album you're probably not gonna hear me do anything like tales from topographical oceans so to speak <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah i don't i don't i don't think i have the patience to write anything like that and i don't think anyone wants to listen to me do a you know a 20 30 minute song like that or closer <laughs> to the edge you know yeah 
about your transcendental <laughs> yeah experience you you have to be a very certain specific type of band to do that stuff yeah and it, and i think especially it, and it was a timing thing too you know early 70s you know i mean i think it, it worked then i don't know if it would work now at, at least with a rock and roll or metal audience um it, it's hard to pull that off now um unless you're in like black metal or something mm. Like, uh, what's that one band? Uh, their name's spelled S-O-A-R. Is it Soar, Soar, Soar? I, I can't remember their name, but they do some stuff like that, and it's like the weird ambient kind of long music pieces, and they're fun. Yeah. Or, you know, like a, like a Therion even, you know, a Therion would be great for that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Therion, great band. I've been listening to them again lately. Cool. Yeah. That might be part of where the keyboards, you know, there's a little more keyboards on the, 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 the album. That's probably yeah. some on cradle of filth influence oh, okay yeah maybe that's what, I, that's what i love about your music is there's so much going on it's 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 i mean you know you get you know like like with any band you kind of get and I, I don't want to use the term pigeonholed but you get put in a box of being thrash metal you know at yeah. least by the powers that be whatever you know metal well, I, so I sort of put myself in that because yeah. i was like well, we're just gonna call it power thrash yeah but you're doing yeah there's so much yeah there's you know and, and just by speaking with you and you know all the bands you've mentioned and how different you know like cradle of filth and slayer and yes and i mean you know this very wide breadth of of music which is you know another thing that i love about what you do and and not just with the, with, with your music but also also with your podcast is that you obviously listen to a lot of music and a lot of different styles of music and yeah. genres and subgenres and you know all of that ad nauseum but it's it's amazing it's it's cool and it's what i love about um like yeah well a well versed a well educated a well a rounded musician is somebody that i think listens to a lot of different stuff and and yeah, absorbs what they need to from that and create something new and exciting which i think you've definitely done that um with with your with your project well i think it's funny when we look at our own stuff you say new and exciting and you know when you look at your own stuff all you can usually see is the stuff you're borrowing from <laughs> <laughs> it's like zeppelin was new and exciting but then everybody kind of realized oh we see where they got that from you know <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's all old blues music. It, you're like oh there's some lawsuits here okay we yeah. understand that, you know? yeah yeah that's a good point but no, there's probably some death metal influences and things like that. I'm sure. I know there's death oh, metal yeah. style riffs in there. Um, I'm a big fan of Carcass and stuff, and uh, Morbid Angel. Oh, I love Carcass. I've seen Carcass a couple of times. Arch Enemy, um, like the melodic oh. death metal. Yeah, yeah, we grew up on that stuff, and you know, you can probably hear Sepultura and some of the stuff I do, like phrasing wise, with some of the riffs and some of the chugs and stuff. You can probably hear like Troops of Doom or something like that there. You know, cool. Yeah, cool. I love this. I love that music. Yeah, me too. I mean, metal is such a wide genre, and I talk about that on the podcast, too. It's so very wide. There's so much you can do with it, and there's so much you can borrow from and take. And, uh, you know, even when you step out of it, there's stuff you can bring in. Like, I got in a big country kick where I was, like, really into Chet Atkins and listened to a shit ton of Dolly Parton, and I'd pay attention to what the bass players were doing and stuff like that. Hmm. And, like, on the first album, there's little things I do that are nods to, like, my more southern roots, I guess you'd say. Oh, okay. Where I'm doing some of the writing between, you know, those roots and the fifths and stuff like that up and down. But probably a little bit Hispanic influence too there because, you know, there's there's such a large like Latino Hispanic community where I live that you hear mariachi like <laughs> pretty regularly, you know, and you know those bass lines and that stuff. Boom, 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 boom. It, it sticks in your brain and it somehow it winds up being part of what you do when you right. play band. Yeah. yeah that, that's another thing about doing this music too, man, is it's like you uh, have to approach every instrument you do a little bit differently. So it doesn't become stale and it's just like, oh, he's just playing, you know, the guitar riffs on the bass or the drums are just, you know, like Lars Ulrich following what the guitar is doing or like, you know, early Geezer Butler where, you know, or not Geezer Butler, um, Bill Ward, where his drum style kind of just followed what Tony was doing. You know, you could tell Tony was the one leading that band. Yeah. Um, not that that's bad. It sounds great with them. Yeah. I'm yeah. not knocking Sabbath anyone. Don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get a shit ton of emails like this son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. I, I would never knock Sabbath. I love them. Um, 
but you have to approach every instrument you do differently. And now at this point, I, I actually program the drums. I don't actually play drums. I program them. Uh, it, it's funny because, man, we just got a review and I was like, Billy, they don't realize that I program the drums. I don't play the drums because this this girl's just like, what a drummer. My God, he's so amazing. You know? <laughs> It's like, oh, she didn't realize. We'll just maybe her to keep this quiet and let everybody think I play drums. Yeah, I didn't know that they were programmed. The, you See, know, there you go. Yeah, I did. I didn't. I had no idea. I thought you had a drummer. How much music do you listen to in your life? I mean, how much music have you listened to in your life? Let's think about that for a second. Because so, over the years, you've developed, you know, an ear for for music. Yeah. So if I can pull somebody like you or somebody else that it's not fake drums it's not you know samples and a program then i'm doing my job right yeah you're doing it right that's, that's what i'm sure. going for um it there's there's a lot to do on that production of that production side you're right because i produce it and mix it and master it and write it and pass it off to billy and say here you go put some lyrics to it come up with a nice melody and then he comes back sometimes with just an idea and we work from there nice that's cool we try to let stuff sit too, man. That's what I'm worried about with the fall EP is we're not going to have it done like enough time to let it sit for like a, a couple of weeks before we go, okay, we're releasing it. Because we do like to let it sit for a couple of weeks, analyze it, and then come back. Make sure you've got everything the way you want it. It's such a process, man. I would imagine, especially if, I mean, you're doing <laughs> all of it. <laughs> like you're doing yeah, no, everything. Right. It's I, everything. And I would imagine, yeah, you kind of need to step away from it, you know, at some point, because you're probably so in, you're so involved and you're so in the weeds. It's like, all right, I need to step back and look at it from like 30,000 feet. And like, okay. Well, the edge out of work, I've been working on 50 something hours a week, you know, for the past few weeks. So it's been like, eh, I kind of can step away from it a little bit and yeah, not pick up a guitar. And that's actually an Alex Lifeson influence, believe it or not. Oh, interesting. Uh, I've always been a big fan of his, and one of the things he would say is it's important to take two or three days away from your instrument if you plan on writing. Yes, hmm. you're going to come back and you're going to be rusty. You might not be able to do exactly what you need to do, but you can get the idea down, practice, and then come back to it and clean it up. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. Lifeson, man, God, such a, once again, underappreciated guitar player. Yeah, I'm a massive Rush fan. Huge Rush. I oh, love, God, I love Rush. Like, even 80s stuff. Like, their 80s, like, oh, yeah, synth, all of it. synth, prog, pop, whatever you want to call it. It's definitely not sticks. You know, yeah. when people say, like, synth, prog rock, you know, I, I think of, like, sticks or something like that. And it's 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 definitely something all its own. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, nobody sounds like them. People no. I mean, you've been going to but... the 90s and then into the early 2000s, like, People, I've heard so many people talk shit about Vapor Trails, and I'm like, you're crazy. This is a really good album. No, it's brilliant. That's like, brilliant. how do you take time signatures like that and things like that and make it to where it's, uh, you know, it's understandable? Yeah. You can kind of relate to it and enjoy the swing and the groove of the music, even though it's in like seven, eight. Yeah. 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 It's, I, I thought that, that album was genius. I thought it was great. I mean, and it was. You know, especially when you look at, you know, Test for Echo was before that album, you know, and there was several years apart because of, uh, of you know, Neil's, Neil's. tragedies. Um, but it, it's such a different album. And it was kind of shocking at the time when it came out, when it was released. It was like, whoa, this is this is Rush. But yeah. um, but it was, you know, I liked it from the very beginning. I loved it. Um, but it was a shock. I will say that it was. You know, it kind of took me back, like, whoa, because it was not what I was expecting at all. A lot of people seem to have an issue with the uh, the mixing and the mastering on that album, the original mix yeah. and master. And they did a remix and a remaster. And honestly, I don't like the remix and remaster as much as I did the first one. I'm I'm right there with you. I agree. Yeah, there was something gritty and, you know, about the first one. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Now, now like, I, I've heard, like, remasters and stuff of Blind Guardian's earlier stuff, and I think some of that sounds better. Like, sometimes you take something like that, and you can, you can bring it back, and it sounds better, because, like, oh, they brought up the keyboard here, they brought up the guitar a little bit. You know, this is... You're, you're getting a little extra something there. Yeah. But, like, do we need Motorhead remasters? Let's be <laughs> honest. Yeah, no, no. 
Yeah. Who sits there and is like, you know, this would be a good album if y'all remaster it. No, it's fucking Motorhead. Yeah. It it's supposed to sound gritty. It's supposed to sound dirty. Yeah. I don't want to remaster Kill Em All or Master of Puppets, you know? No. Just like uh, Megadeth, man, like with uh, like uh, all the remasters they did where David oh. lost vocal tracks. Yeah, he was full of shit on that one. Yeah, I, I love that thing, but he is full of shit. Yes, he is. He just wanted to take Ellison off those because they were not getting along at the time. Yeah, well, it was like that whole thing with you know with Ozzy. Well, it was more Sharon with um, uh, you know Lee Kur Lee Kurslake and uh, you know Daisley when they yeah re-released -re that with them not on the album, so they wouldn't have to pay them. Re-recorded yeah. the you know the bass and the drums just to be shitheads, and uh, and yeah, you can tell it doesn't sound right. It doesn't oh. sound the same. Well, Kurt Slake and Daisley were such unique musicians in their own right. Yeah. You know, as good as Randy was and as big a fan as I am of Randy, I'll say up and down, I think Randy Rhodes was probably the great, greatest to ever do it. From a composition and a technique, you know, standpoint, uh, just an understanding of the instrument, I think he's one of the, probably the best to ever do it. But, um, you know, I, I don't think without Daisley and Kurt Slake there, I don't think it comes out the way it did because I think, you know, their experience and Randy's knowledge put together just really gave us two of the best albums ever. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, you know, there's always this, been this debate. I remember since I was like a teenager, even in the early like 2000s, people are like, oh, Randy or Eddie, Randy or Eddie. And it's like, well, I think Randy, but yeah, I also think Randy because he had two solid albums with no filler. And with Van Halen, it's like, there's so much filler on their albums outside of the first album. Yeah, that's true. Like, I feel like there's a lot of filler on, you know, everything after the first Van Halen, minus like 1984 or 5150. But 5150, it felt like they were reinvigorated because they had a new, you know, a new singer with Sammy. And Eddie was able to ex you know, experiment more because he didn't have Dave with him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, do something a little different. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. And um, I'm not knocking Van Halen either. You got to watch, you got to watch doing that right now because people get real fucking touchy. <laughs> yeah they do yeah that's true. like I, post, I posted a thing uh the other day about um kid tries to relearn kid angry he can't relearn song that was recorded on bath salts and cocaine you know <laughs> <laughs> and it's a picture of van halen and then this kid trying to play and some dude just whew, blew that out of proportion because i was making fun of eddie apparently yeah, people get yeah, like you said, people get pretty touchy sometimes about you know like things they hold near and dear, uh, even though they've never met the person, they don't know. Yeah, it, no. But yeah, just you know, it's like oh, this is this is mine. This is my you know like. Well, you can still laugh about it a little bit. I mean, you know, look at Rush; they make fun of themselves. All the Shit! Time. Look at Ozzy. Yeah, yeah. Part of being a Ozzy fan is making fun of Ozzy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You kind of <laughs> have to. Yeah, it's like a rite of passage. I thought it was great that the last time when it was the last tour, Rush, the their very last tour, I thought it was great that uh, Getty was wearing a Rash t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that was hysterical. Um, well, I think that's what made Metallica so special, too, in, like, the 80s. Like, you know, you had the uh, the Alcoholica posters and stuff like that. And yeah. You had James coming up there calling Kirk, Kirk Hamster, and when they'd sing Whiplash, he'd be like, Dick Rash, you know. <laughs> Yeah, they had a sense of humor, whereas now it seems like it's a machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a brand, you know. And that's 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 probably Lars, really there, but yeah, yeah. Hey, like said, Lars, yeah. man. Like even if he's not the greatest drummer in the world, my God, what a marketing genius! Yeah, he's he he's right up there with Gene Simmons. <laughs> I don't know that anybody's up there with Gene Simmons. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a hard thing to top. Yeah, and I think Metallica's pro. I, I, I would imagine Metallica sold more music than Kiss because Kiss has never been like. Yeah, when you so. look at Kiss, you're not like, oh, they've sold like, they've sold a shit ton of albums, but by comparison to the amount of merch they've sold and you know how much they can charge for concert tickets and stuff. Yeah, it pales in comparison. Yeah, I agree. When you think of Kiss, like especially if you look at like the seventies or something, it's like, oh, uh, they're a, a marketing merch machine. Even then, yeah, yeah, you I know, know like, the, the they, they understood the art of the gimmick. You know, it goes into like wrestling. Like Gene Simmons could have been a wrestling promoter and done fantastic. He could have, you know, run Vince 
probably out of business, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, when you get all the guys and they get their blood and put it in a vial and they pour it into the comic book ink, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you're using that as a gimmick to sell your merch, man, that's something that's, it's disgusting, but it's smart. Yeah. It's next level marketing. Yeah. That's yeah. knowing the, knowing the things we know about, you know, like AIDS and stuff like that and transfer of blood. And, you know, yeah. Is, yeah. Crazy. Oh. Such a crazy time. That was a crazy time. Oh, um, nobody thought about that in the seventies. No, no. Um, I did want to ask you, so, sorry, totally different topic. No, you're fine. Go um, for it. Your show, man. Ask, yeah, I was curious about your uh, like your beginnings in music. Did you come from a musical family? Like, how did this all start for you? Yeah, actually, a little bit of a musical family. Like, all my cousins and stuff played, and my, my Uncle Max had came and brought me a guitar when I was 12. Hmm. I had started listening to Metallica a year before when I was 11. Uh, I'd heard Ride the Lightning and started with that, you know. And I kind of just decided, like, well, hell, I want to play guitar like these two guys. You know, it was like James and Kirk. I want to be, or, or yeah, I want to be like them. So that's uh, kind of the start of that coming from a musical family. Like, we've got people down the line in our family, too. Like, there was a famous country singer in our family way back when in the 50s and such named Patty Page. Oh, I've heard of So Patty we come Page. down with the line from that. Um, one of my cousins actually. I believe it was Randy Travis. He was teaching guitar lessons too at one point. Really? So yeah, I'd be uh, Alan Tatum was his name. Wow, he's not with us anymore. Uh, may you rest in peace. Him and Greg both. Uh, but you know they were they were definitely influential to me because they you know gave me like my first Satriani. Like back then it was tapes and Steve Vai tapes and stuff. You know it was the first time I heard those guys. And, cool. Alan would show me like, he's like, here's how you play Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. And then he'd tune his guitar all the way down, you know, and it's like, you got to really tune it down. So it's heavy. And like, he showed me those riffs and stuff. Um, you know, there, there were always people I could ask questions to, uh, just growing up with my papa in general, because he had such a love of like instrumental rock. Like I grew up listening to like the ventures and stuff. Oh, cool. So there's a lot of influence there, you know, uh, just thinking back to all that influence he had on me as a kid, showing me that stuff. Yeah. You know, we, when we were, it was after his funeral, uh, me and my buddy were talking while we were drinking those deliriums and he was like, uh, you know what I remember the most about your papa? And I said, what's that? When he'd come into the room and we'd be listening to Metallica or Slayer and go, won't you boys put on some damn ventures or something? <laughs> <laughs> You know, just little stuff like that. Um, That's cool. But I, I can go back and listen to that stuff and really appreciate it, you know. And just go into a band like The Ventures, you know. They they covered so much other people's music and lead you in all these different directions. Yeah. And I, I think that's why they were so successful. And I think that's one, been one of the successful things about Metallica because they're sort of like a... They're a branch. And if you follow it back, you know, to the roots of the tree, there's so much there with Metallica. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's interesting uh, that the vent you mentioned the ventures. I mean, I'd uh, I'd be hard pressed to remember who the musician was, but I know it was a it was a metal musician. I think more like a thrash metal musician. I don't remember who it was, but he cited the ventures as a huge influence on his guitar work. And I cannot remember who it was, but uh, I'd believe it because you can listen to a song like Pipeline, and there's so much thrash in that. Hmm. Yeah. Like uh, some of the the melody stuff too in the middle of it, you know, the harmony kind of things going on there in the middle section of Pipeline that you think of like the middle sections of thrash songs. And it's kind of, it's been a long influence on the stuff I do because the way I structure things, hmm. it's probably a little bit like a, a pipeline to start with, with lyrics. And then it goes into the middle section to that bridge with all the instrumental stuff. So there's probably a big influence there from my childhood with the ventures. Yeah, that's cool. Actually, so far, this interview has been very therapeutic, and I, I might actually get home and write something tonight. <laughs> oh, good. I'm, well, so, if I can help inspire that, I yeah, that's awesome. I love that. That's very cool. Yeah, you, you know, it's uh, you, you reach a certain point in music, man, where like even the people around you sometimes you go off in these directions, and maybe not everybody around you understands it. So you, you kind of have to find outside people sometimes, too, and you're able to actually talk about things. Yeah, you know, we usually get to do that. And that's what I love about doing the podcast. Yeah, because I'll, I'll get people on there and they'll just you know talk about whatever, and it's like, oh shit, I forgot about that, you know, or like, oh, I've been into that lately. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I mean, that's the yeah. If if I can 
if I can help bolster anything there, I, you know, like I said, I, the summer EP, I love it. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the fall EP. So yeah, get on it. <laughs> That's the thing that scares the shit out of me is when people are like, man, I can't wait to hear fall. And it's like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, it, it, it is a hard thing to do because you get so picky after you've done three of these things and you're like, everyone's gotten better. Mm. So you have to find something with the fourth one where you're getting better. Yeah. You, know? you have to improve upon it and build. I, I think if you're not building and improving your music too, you're kind of just sitting dead in the water then. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Like, uh, you know, you listen to like early black flag and then you listen to them when they got closer to like Edwin Ra after Rollins left, you know, they, they grew a lot, you know? Right. Right. Like damage 13 is just a raw, aggressive punk album. And then uh, my war, you know, you come up to my war, and it's just like, what am I listening to? You know, yeah, yeah. It, it's such a almost experimental thing. And I've I've heard people in like doom metal cite that as like one of their biggest influences. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, um, Patrick Salerno from Grave Next Door is one of them. He 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 said that was one of his biggest influences was my war. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, oh, and I can kind of see it that. sometimes. Pardon? I mean, honestly, one of my biggest influences was right behind your head over there. It's uh, Show No Mercy. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, like what an album. I, I can see Venom looks like black metal down there. Maybe a poster from a show or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, it's an action figure. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's the action figure. Yeah, I saw the Super Sevens. I like Super Seven. Yeah. Diamond back there, and I'm like, I just saw King Diamond a few months ago, uh, like last year. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, we saw Merciful Fate, and it was just God. It was so good. Yeah. Is that okay? That's I think that's Hyrax or Havoc. I thought it was Deicide for a second. Oh, yeah. I've got the, yeah, there's Hyrax. There's, I'm trying to look, see where you're looking. Yeah. The Hyrax is right above my head. That's right above your head. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think I was looking at that and I was like, does he have, uh, you know, <laughs> get out of the way? Metal collecting is, is so. It's addictive when you get into metal. There's so much stuff you can collect too. It's almost like the comic books and shit. Oh yeah, it's insane. Yeah, if you saw so this, so I'm in my studio as I do a little just amateur painting. Um, but the so the wall you see behind me, the entire room is like this, including the ceiling. It's just and over here I have action figures and yeah, that's what my, and, that's yeah. kind of what my limit my living room's like. Uh, oh, you nice. know where I do my recording and stuff, and it's like. All Ghost Rider stuff, bunch of Daredevil stuff, all oh, the right vinyl. Right. There's, you know, 10 guitars over here and, you know, kids' toys over here, TV. You know? Nice. I love it. That's that's a good so, way to live. That's a good way to live. Yeah, no, um, enjoy, the, you know, things you enjoy. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, Mike, this has been awesome chatting with you. I do have, I have one last question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a awesome son bitch today. You good? No, no, that's that's great. Uh, so as you know, my my page is Bruise and Tunes. Uh, yep. So I pair. Um, so not on my podcast, but on my actual page, I pair uh, craft beer with metal albums, mostly metal, hard rock, metal. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so it's a Saturday night. You know, you're not okay. working. Mike's hanging out at home. What beer are you drinking and what album are you spinning? What's your pairing for the uh day? you know tonight it'll probably be that Clawhammer Oktoberfest mm -hmm. and Gravehuffer Depart from So Much Evil. Right on. I love it. So yeah, y'all got a really yeah. underground album there. So here's a question. I got one question before for you before we stop this. Sure, yeah. Have you ever been in a Facebook group called uh, Metal on Vinyl? Sounds familiar. I don't know if I have. I, I used to see people in that group all the time, and they paired, you know, like you were talking about doing, they paired, you know, beers and alcohol, liquor, whatever, with their vinyls, okay, you know? Cool. Nice. Yeah, so I thought, well, maybe maybe I've seen this guy's post before just in that group. You may have. I post, I, I do share my posts on a bunch of other, like on metal and beer groups, um, but a bunch of metal groups. I, I share it on metal, but I don't know if I'm on that group or not. I'm so bad with names, I forget. Metal and Vinyl is such a good one, too. Um, I hadn't been there in a while, but that'd probably be a good place for you. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. 
I'll definitely but I think you have to do it with like your personal profile too. You can't, they don't let like pages in. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I could do that. Yeah, I could do that. Cause I do, I do oh. share, I share through my, like I'll share my post, but as me. I, yeah. I've done that a few times with the various groups. Cause kind of obligatory, thing. obligatory thing here. Uh, you know, thanks again to Ben for putting this together from online. Yeah. Metal so if you guys need, uh, you know, PR, Ben and online metal promo is the place to go. That's online metal promo.net. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Great yeah. guy. Um, I think that's all I got to take care of. And, you know, fall EP is coming out. Check out that. Yeah. New episode, metal thrashing nerd podcast. And I took care of all that for you there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And that'll be in the description below. There'll be links to uh, uh, both infernal tyrant and to uh, your, your podcast as well. So people can check that out. And definitely subscribe to uh, to, to Mike's page. It's great. Um, lots of kill, killer interviews. Um, really fun to watch. And uh, and as you probably as you know from this interview, Mike is a uh, is an encyclopedia of information about metal, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, very. It, this has been a, a pleasure chatting with you, my friend. Thank Absolutely. you so much. No, this has been really fun. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. I love this show, by the way. This oh, thank is great. You. Yeah, thank you so much.